Oh, we hope to get this loud enough now. As I said, I, I've had it just for one of these things, but uh, you get to one side a little bit, it gets loud. And so we want it to be where you can understand and want you to relax. You know, I, I believe uh, what makes this thing, everybody sort of nervous here tonight, is so many independent Baptists together, brother. That's on one thing, you know. Usually the independent, God bless their heart, they'll see one walking down the street, and he'll say, no, nah, I'm going to walk the other side. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm independent. But I want you to forget tonight that uh, that's why we're having this revival in this auditorium. I want you just to forget tonight which church you're from, and I want you to realize that you belong to the body of Christ if you've been saved, and if you hadn't been saved, we hope you get saved before it's over tonight. And I want you to think, every one of you, those from Northside, those from this church, those from the other churches, I want you to think now that Brother Jack's got this revival, he's going to be speaking to somebody, but he's speaking to you, and he's speaking to me tonight. I want God to speak to my heart. Our speaker tonight is certainly no stranger in our midst, uh, particularly in the city of Charlotte. And he's been so successful, and uh, he's been used of God for many fields. It's almost difficult to introduce him without making a long string of adjectives, but uh, I guess that the best way I can introduce him is just uh, tell my folks at Harbor Baptist, you've heard the imitation, now let's listen to the real thing. Brother Jack Hudson. All right. Thank you, Brother Don. I'm glad I had an opportunity to fellowship with you a few moments ago and by saying a few words, so I won't have to take too long now. But I do, again, appreciate this privilege, and glad to see these preacher boys here. And I say boys, I'm saying that with the greatest respect. One thing I've noticed, there's been considerable change physically in some of them. I, I, I'm, I'm sincere when I say this, and I don't mean anything I say derogatory, but I noticed Brother Gene Cole's hair is turning gray. I'm serious. It, it, I was just surprised when I saw him. Just re- I didn't know where he hadn't just forgot to, whatever you do to your hair, you know, I didn't know. And his is turning gray, and Brother Ralph Benfield's is about to turn loose. I mean, it's, it's about quit. Brother Ralph, did I ever give you that poem? God is good, God is fair. To some he gave brains, to others he gave hair. That'll help you now, won't it? Brother Fushi, I looked back through there a little bit ago, and I, I can always recognize him. You see, his problem is he's eaten so much strawberry pie, it turned his hair red. And I saw Brother Jimmy Kennedy a while ago, and I didn't know which side he was standing on. He, he's, he's one of the biggest all-around preachers I've seen in a long time. He just, he just put on some weight, and, well, I could go on like this, but uh, that probably, that probably they'll get me for this, I'm sure of that, but... It's a joy to be with these men, and I thank God for every soul they've been able to lead to the Lord and every person they've helped to direct uh, towards a Savior. And if you love Him better tonight than you did yesterday, then that's an accomplishment towards the Lord. I remember many years ago, I stood right at this front door, and I, any of you preachers know when you preach, you sometimes the Lord does it every bit, and that's, that's what you live for, just to be in a service where the Lord preaches. And you stand and listen. You learn as much as anybody else. And sometimes you kind of do the introduction and do the winding up, and then the Lord takes over in the middle, and that's a great blessing too. Then sometimes the Lord just lets you do it by yourself. Now, that's the hardest work I've ever done in my life. I've dug ditches and done a lot of hard work, but I've never done anything as hard as just preaching by yourself. But that morning, it was about the middle of the road somewhere, and I went back there, and a lady was uh, came by as I was standing there shaking hands, and tears were on her face, and she said, Preacher, that was the greatest message I ever heard. Well, I didn't particularly think it was that great, but I, the Holy Spirit seemed to say to me, Now, son, if you'll think about that for a little while, you'll learn something. And I did think about it, and I did learn something, and this is what I learned. It wasn't the greatest message that I'd ever preached, perhaps, but the reason it was a great message, it was what she needed at that particular time. You know, I've often wondered if any of us would just sit and think in our mind, what is the greatest message we ever heard? Where did we hear it, and who preached it? And if we could duplicate exactly those same conditions, that is, take you back to exactly the same church, put you on the same pew, have exactly the same preacher, preach exactly the same, it probably wouldn't do a half for you what it did when you heard it. And the secret I learned from that is it's not a message, it's the message. You see, God knows my heart, God knows your heart, God knows what we need. And so tonight, I go today, all day, I've asked the Lord what he wanted me to bring. And tonight I'm bringing a message that God wants us to hear together. And so, open your Bibles, if you will, and uh, we'll, we'll be looking at some verses, but primarily I want us to go to the book of Psalms, and uh, I want us to look at Psalms 51. Now, as we look at it, I want to make these few remarks, again, in traveling 
over this country and preaching to so many people by both means of radio and television and then in person. I see a trend in our churches that bother me more than communism, more than neo-orthodoxy or neo-evangelicalism, neo all these other phrases that people think of somehow or other. I see a trend that bothers me, and here's what it is. We're offering a salvation that has no repentance in it. And people are coming forward and shaking the preacher's hand or calling in over the television and telling somebody they got saved, but there's no repentance in it. And I believe the Word of God when it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, and behold, all things have become new. I appreciated what Brother Ballard said tonight. He remembered when God did something for him. I believe when you get saved, I believe when God does something for you, I believe you remember it. I celebrated my spiritual birthday last Wednesday, February the 22nd, about 9.15, in the basement of the Tabernacle Baptist Church. I got saved. I've never gotten over it. I've never gotten used to it. And my daily prayer is, Lord, don't ever let me get used to being saved. I don't ever want to get used to it. I, God called me to preach. I was in a meeting. My pastor, God bless him, preached. I never knew what he preached. God had been dealing with him. i have never been so miserable in my life. And my prayer was, Lord, don't let me, don't let this not satisfy me. I've tried so many things, trying to find peace of heart, but nothing seemed to satisfy me. And when the pastor gave the invitation, I got out of my seat in the Tabernacle Baptist Church and walked by him and through the door, just like this door is to the right, and I went back into a darkened Sunday school class and didn't get on my knees. I got on my face. I just got on my stomach, on my face before God. And the words the best that I can remember were something like this, God, you must be mighty hard up for preachers, but if, if you want me, I'll preach. I never wanted to do anything else. I've never wanted to be something else and a preacher. I've never wanted to be something on the side and preacher. I never had wanted to be anything else but a preacher. That's all I've ever wanted to be. God has given me what I've wanted to be all my life. I just wanted to be a preacher. That's all I've ever wanted to do since that day. And I believe this. I remember the night, the moment I got saved, and there came a change in my life, and God gave me such a jerk towards heaven, I've been out of step with this world ever since. This world's not my home, folks. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And I, I'm expecting to go there one day. And I expect to give an account. When I got saved, I knew it. And I believe the second thing that we're facing today is not only lack of repentance and salvation, but there's lack of confession and forgiveness. Did you know that the Lord tells us that we must confess our sins to the Lord? I may make a statement to you. It's been many years since I've asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I didn't say I hadn't had times that when I needed sins forgiven. That's about every hour. But it's been a long time. In fact, is I can't even remember the last time I asked God to forgive me of my sins. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. It says in 1 John 1 and 9, If we confess our sins, he is just and right to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, what comes first? Confession. There is a lack of confession in forgiveness. It's been watered down today to where it's almost we've made a spiritual slot machine. And we poke in a confession at the top, pull the handle, and out of the bottom comes the forgiveness. And we run on as if nothing happened or nothing will change in our life. And we look at... It's saying almost as if we do it a cafeteria line. It said, well, this costs so much, and I may have a little problem with this or that and the other, but after all that will be over, and that's all that will be to it, and I'll go on about my business. But, beloved, I want you to know that God does not take that view of it. And until the church of Jesus Christ comes back and put repentance and salvation and confession and forgiveness, we're going to lose this thing faster than we're losing it now. I read in the newspaper last week, it said that television now has more influence in the shaping the minds of Americans more than the church, our political figures, or our schools. And beloved, until we come back, I still believe that the power of God is in salvation. And I believe that the power of God in this lost, dying world is getting people right with God. We stand and condemn religionists, and rightly so, and modernism, and rightly so. But I'm afraid today that even in the fundamental ranks we become modernists in the sense of easy forgiven-ism, easy believism. And we need to come back to where there is absolute 
uh, repentance, that is, a person changes, turns around and becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's new. Everybody knows it. And I believe that we need to come back to this. David's sin. I'm not going into his sin because that's not the sin I'm dealing with tonight. In fact, is I'm not dealing with any one sin. I'm talking about S-I-N. I'm talking about sin before God. And sin before God simply means disobeying God. It means missing the mark, whether it's the sin of omission or the sin of commission. That is something you commit or something you omit. That is, you don't do. Now, David goes for a year after his horrible sin, and oh, what a year it was. The most miserable year that that man ever lived. He's a sweet singer of Zion. He's the one who wrote and told us that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and so on. He's the one that wrote the majority of the Psalms and what a blessing they are to our heart. He's the one that God said was the apple of his eye. But there was a period of 12 months in David's life when things happened in his life that you simply would not have believed had happened to him. And finally one day he came to the place where he had God given a confession. He confessed his sin to the Lord and had God given forgiveness and got things right with the Lord. I want you to notice with me now in Psalms 51. Listen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly with mine iniqu- from mine iniquities, and cleanse me from my, my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and against only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, I desire his truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Let's bow our heads together. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I wonder how many of you tonight would first of all in your heart say, Lord, help me to forget everything now that might be happening after the service. Help me to forget everything now. And let me listen to the Word of God tonight. And let me listen to God's man. Perhaps, Lord, you're speaking to my heart. Don't let me think that somebody else needs this message, but let me realize that this message is for me tonight. Would you ask him to do that? Now, secondly, how many of you say, Brother Hudson, I have a burden. I have a prayer request tonight. Now, you may be saint or sinner. You may be praying for yourself or someone else. God knows that, and you know that, and that's all that really matters. But you say, I want to be remembered in this prayer. I want God to do something for me in this service. Would you slip up your hand with me, please? Just slip it up. Let God know you want him to do something for you in this service. All right. God bless you now, Father. I pray that in Jesus' name that the word of God might be exalted and that Jesus Christ might be lifted up. And tonight, may our Father, we recognize sin as it is and see what it does in our lives and that we might confess it and be rid of it. And as a result of it, Lord, have that sweet peace and the fellowship with the Lord Jesus. For it's in his name that we ask it and pray. Amen and amen. You know, I believe that when you think about sin, I don't know of anything any more costly than sin. Because, you see, it affects the most precious possession that you and I uh, hold today. That is our soul. The Lord said, What should a man profit if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The most precious possession that you and I have today are our souls. And anything that bothers that soul 
Then it's a, you know, I, I think of sometimes if you go down to one of these, you know, Kmarts or somewhere and buy a picture for nine ninety five and you'd scratch it and well you wouldn't lose very much. But supposing it was a great picture by one of the great artists. Maybe it was valued at a million dollars and somebody damaged it. You'd say, My, what an awful waste. It would go in the newspapers around the world because it had damaged something priceless. Now, beloved, anything that taints, anything that bothers, anything that distorts my soul or yours can be the most costly thing that could ever happen to us because there's nothing that we can ever own any more priceless, any more precious than our soul. Now, I want you to show you, if you will, first of all, what sin does to us, the cost of sin in our life. First of all, notice what it says in verse number 3. It says it affects your eyes. Did you notice that? Look at verse number 3. For I acknowledge my sin, my pardon me, my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. You know, I believe it's impossible to commit sin without seeing things that remind you of it. Seeing things that remind you of it. I remember many years ago now, I stood in this pulpit one Sunday morning and preached, and after the service was over, most of the people had gone. I was standing over near this very door. A lady came to me. I stood there with my leg up against that uh, a pew, and she said to me, weeping, she said, Pastor, our preacher, uh, she wasn't a member here. She said, I need to talk to you for a minute. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be glad to help you. What can I do for you? She had to stop a minute because she was sobbing, and she wiped out the corners of her eyes. And she said to the preacher, oh, she said, I wish you'd pray for me. I don't know of anything else you can do for me, but I wish you'd pray for me. I said, what is it? She said, you see, 13 years ago, I had a baby, and the moment it was born, I gave it away. I didn't keep it. 13 years ago, this would have been his birthday. And she said, today, as I saw the boys and girls going out of here, I wondered how many of them were 13. I wondered how my child would have looked now. And she dabbed her eyes. And she said, every time I see a little boy, I think of my boy. I gave away 13 years ago. You see, it bothered her eyes. And everything she saw reminded her of it. A man can steal. A man can be unfaithful to his vows. A man can do whatever it is that men do. A woman can be guilty of the same things down the line. And every time they see something, it reminds them of it. I had a lady call me one day and she said, I've got to see you. Could I see you? I've never laid eyes on her before. I've never seen her since. She came into my study and sat down. She was a well-dressed lady, well-educated, had a very responsible job. She was bonded for a great amount of money. And she said, Preacher, I did something. And she went into detail. It's not interesting enough to go into here. She'd taken a credit card that belonged to someone else. And she said, Preacher, I knew it was wrong. I've never one time been charged. I don't even have a speeding ticket against my name. She said, but I took that credit card and I put some things on it, charged them, got my children some things. And it amounted to, oh, just a hundred dollars or so. And she sat there and cried and cried and cried. And she said, I use it and now they've called up with me. Here's what she said. Every time I see a credit card, I think about it. David said, my sin is ever before me. Every time he saw something, it reminded him of his sin. It will affect you in your eyes. Then notice what else he said. Notice in verse number 8. He said, make me to hear joy and gladness. Make me to hear joy and gladness. He wasn't hearing any joy. Did you know it will affect your ears as well? It will affect your ears. I was in my study one day, and the, the secretary came in there. She said, there's a man out here who wants to see you. And didn't have an appointment, but he, he said he needed to see you. She said, preacher, I, I really believe he needs to see you. And I said, tell him to come in. And the man came in well-dressed, immaculate, had on, I believe, even tailor-made suits. I mean, he was just above the average. And, I, you know, he came in and introduced himself, and I'd never seen him before. And, in fact, if I've ever seen him since, I don't know it. But he told me he was an executive for a large chain. And he came in and sat down, and he said, Preacher, I'm saved. I know that I'm saved, but I'm not right with the Lord. I said, Well, we'll see what we can do to help it. He said, But you don't understand. I'm not right with God. I said, I know What's wrong? He said, well, preacher, listen. He said, I'm a born-again Christian. I know that. He said it about four or five times. He said, I'm a born-again Christian. He said, I travel all the time. He said, I'm in and out of offices. He said, but I, I used to go in and I'd witness to the secretaries. He said, now when I go in, I look at them. I don't, I don't witness anymore. But he said, preacher, I lust after them. You see, he had some trouble with his eyes. But he wasn't through he said, there's something else. I said, what is it? He said, you see, I, I've got tapes in my car now. 
And he said, they're, they're, they're good gospel tapes. And he told me the name of some of them. Jerry Wayne Bernard and the Gethsemane Quartet and some of them. They were good ones. He said, I used to listen to them all the time. But he said, I don't listen to them anymore. He said, instead, I turn on my radio and I listen to the rock and roll music now. You see what he was saying? There was something wrong with his eyes. Instead of witnessing to the secretaries, he was listening after them. Instead of listening to the gospel music, he was listening to the rock and roll. Beloved, I'll tell you right now, you can always tell when there's sin in your life. You don't have to have a preacher to analyze you. You don't know, need to go to a psychiatrist and lie down on a couch and tell him when you were born and the first thing you remembered as a child and if your father was good to you. You listen to the music, analyze the music that you're listening to, and you'll know when you're right with God. If you can listen to these ungodly stations and hear all the mockery and advertising the ungodliness that they advertise and this rock and roll music, you mark it down below that you're not right with God. Your ears are wrong. And when your ears are right, make me to hear joy. And you want to hear amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved an old wretch like me. And you want to sing, heaven is my home. And you want to sing about the things of God. You'll ride along in your car and you'll turn that on. And it's so offensive, it's like smelling something that's obnoxious. And you want to cut it off. You'd rather sing yourself about how sweet the Lord is on the hills of Zion. And you'll sing about the things of the Lord. He said, my ears are not blind. I don't hear joy, Lord. It's the things of the world. I'll tell you something else your ears will do. Your ears will listen to gossip when you're not right with God. Yes, sir. You know, when somebody says, now I'm not gossiping, but what they really mean is I'm fixing the gossip. I've often wondered if we ought to have us a little sign painted with a little stick on it and have a hole punched in the ear like ladies do and put a little sign there and say, dump your trash here. And beloved, when we're right with the Lord, David says in the Psalms 101, I will not listen privately to my neighbors in my house. It means your ears are right. I'm talking about confessing with God and getting things right. You say, oh, Brother Hudson, I told the Lord I'm sorry. That's not confession. Because your ears are still wrong, but that's not all. Look, if you will, at verse number 10. Create within me a clean heart. Now, the heart there obviously is not talking about the fleshly pump. Rather, it's talking about the control mechanism. Now, your heart is that which controls us. You know what he's really talking about? Priorities. What's first in your life? Well, I know what the Lord said ought to be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things shall be added unto you. On Sunday morning, what comes first in your life? Beloved, there ought to be a question in your mind. Did you know my wife and I have been married 36 years? Now, I know that's surprising to some of you. You didn't think I was any older than that, Harley, but we've been married 36 years. Ever since I've been saved, there's been a rule in my house. I'm the first one up on Sunday morning. Unless I'm in the hospital, I'm the first one up. I believe that the man is to be the spiritual high priest in his family. I don't ever, as long as since the day I got saved, ever remember me lying in bed. My wife had to say, aren't you going to Sunday school this morning? Why don't you get up and go with the kids? They'd love for you to go this morning. Now, beloved, when you have to have your wife and kids to beg you to go to church and Sunday school, there's something wrong with your priorities. The greatest place you can be is in the house of the Lord. And when you say something else takes the preeminence, something else takes the precedence, then there's something wrong with your control mechanism. And I know what it is, and you know what it is. It's sin. I may not know what's sin, but I know it's sin. When somebody begins to find fault with the churches and say, well, I just don't like to go. There's something wrong. And the choir sings too loudly, or the preacher preaches too short, or doesn't preach, or he preaches too long. They can find fault anywhere. Beloved, I'll tell you, when your heart's right to the Lord, it's a different thing, isn't it? Why, you can't wait to get there. You say, wonder why the week to 945 to start? You say, Mom, it seems to me like our teacher just got started this morning. He's only been speaking 45 minutes. Fine. And look here, we have to wait 15 minutes between Sunday school and church. And my, look at those great old songs. Aren't they wonderful? Why? Listen to them as they sing. Why, I wish they'd sing another one. And you'd sing about 
There is a land that is fair and day, and by faith we can see it afar. And the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. And you say, oh, that's so true. And you sing great old songs, and you say, my, that's so good. Then the pastor gets up and opens the Word of God, and you say, my, I know he's got something for me today. God's going to speak to my heart. And the pastor begins to preach, and it seems like he gets through, and you say, why, I, he didn't even get through with this introduction. You're not looking for your shoes, brother. You're not looking around. The problem today with Christians are too many clock-eyed Christians. Brother, they can watch a 90-minute television program and they think 20 minutes preaching is too long. You can't shape people's lives in 20 minutes. And the other I'm trying to say, David said, Lord, my heart's not right. Lord, I'm just not right. Notice what else he said. Look in verse 10. Create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, a right spirit means attitude. You know one of the most difficult things to deal with is attitude. People's attitude. Don't you like to see people with a positive attitude? I tell you people with negative attitudes, do they bother you? Well, I don't know. Try to write everything. Just the Lord doesn't even like it. The reason I know that's murmuring. You know what murmuring is? I don't know that, but I'll tell you. When the Lord sent some fiery serpents among those people, and they began to die right and left, and Moses had to enter and see, and make a serpent and put him on a pole, and pray, and they that look to live, they had to have a special unction of grace. God said, I can't despise murdering people. God nearly killed them all. If Moses hadn't interceded, he would have. Negative people. Just walk around. You see dead lice falling off of them every once in a while. <laughs> but like the old mountaineer. He said, honey, call the dog in. Let's see if it's raining. Like the old deacon is having a meeting. The man said, you're going? He said, no, I ain't going. Whatever they're for, I'm again. The other negative attitudes, he said, carried within me a right spirit, a positive spirit. That's why I believe that we ought to have positive attitudes. I believe that we ought to charge hell with a water pistol. I said, let's do it. Let's get it done. God bless this thing all the time, explaining and excusing and back why. Man, I believe we need to get our hearts right. I say, we're going to do it. Amen. And we've got a cause. A story that moved me more than anything I've ever read. I've double-checked it twice so far, and as I know, at least the legend is correct. And they said, I often wonder why they argue as they do over the Isle. It's called the Emerald Isle because it is so green and lush. And they said many, many years ago, when the discoverers first came in there, two opposing groups, that is two people, that is two ships from different countries, came in nearly simultaneously. They met on the beach, and they looked at each other, and they had more land than knew what to do with, and they knew it was going to be a bloody battle, and many of them would die. And so they, being reasonable men at least, they went over and they talked, and they said, well, listen, this is a beautiful and very lush island. Why don't we settle it a diplomatic way? So what do you mean? Well, they said, we've got a sailor here that's unusual, and you've probably got one. You think's the best. We'll put him in ships, and we'll put him off the shore here. And the first one that comes in and puts his hand on this, on this shore, we'll give them, that group the island. They said, all right. One side said, we've got an old, experienced captain, as nobody living can be. The other side had a young, bushy-bearded, red-bearded, Young sailor. And they said, now, he doesn't have the experience. But, boy, he's got the zeal. And they said, okay, we'll do it. So they put the ships offshore. The young fellow with his red beard bristling and the old seasoned veteran captain. The rules of it was the first hand that touched the beach was to get it. They started sailing. The old captain would get to where his ship would catch the draft and the wind and pull him a little faster and block the other one. And they jigged and zagged and they, they seesawed back and forth for positions until they got within about a hundred feet of the shore. And just as they did, the men had been watching and they could see by the, the color of the water there was a shallow place there. And the old veteran captain knew exactly what to do. 
And he forced that young captain's ship over there. And it grounded about 50 feet from the shore. And he started to sail in. And all the men on his side were jubilant. Hey, we won! And suddenly he looked. And that fellow with the bristling red beard ran to the bow of the boat, got him an axe, laid his arm down, and without the second thought, took it and chopped off his hand, cut it completely off. The blood was gushing out. He picked up that hand, and with all of his might, he beat that hand as far as he could throw it, and it landed on the shore. And every man there was reminded of the rules of the contest. The first hand that, lie, that gets on the shore is the hand that winced. The man died. He lost too much blood and he died. But that bloody, lifeless, severed hand won Ireland for that group. Yeah, but I've got a captain more courageous than that. He went to Golgotha's brow and died on Calvary's cross. That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us positive. That's what keeps us moving when everything else is against us. Whatever, don't quit. Get a right spirit. Get a positive spirit. Anything else is dragging your feet. You know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, don't you? I don't think I'm either one, because I'm a Christian. An optimist is a fellow come by and see you in the ditch, and he'll say, Yep, you're in the ditch. I don't worry, fella. God bless you. You'll get out. And he drives along. That's an optimist. Pessimist comes by and he looks and you're in the ditch and he looks at it and he said, Man, you're in there. You'll never get out. Man, you'll never get out. And he drives on. A Christian, I don't think, is an optimist or a pessimist. Because a Christian comes by and looks at him and he said, Man, you're in the ditch. You never are going to get out unless I help you. He backs his car up and hooks a chain to it and pulls it out on the road and both of them goes on down the road good and Now that's what a Christian is. That's what I believe that we ought to do. Let's God, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. And that's what God is saying. Notice something else in verse 11 now. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now this is Old Testament. The Holy Spirit, for those of us that are born again, cannot be taken away. But what he's talking about here is fellowship. You know the best definition of fellowship I've ever heard? Are two fellows in the same ship. Beloved, you can't cut a ship half in two. You can't sink half of it and let the other float. It'll all go down together. And it's been said and said humorously and but said truthfully. We're going to go together. We're going to hang together. One of the two. We've got to stay together. We've got to have fellowship. And I don't know anything any better than fellowship with the believers. Just fellowshipping with God's people. Just fellowshipping. We need to do it. Notice in verse number 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now, you notice what he said? He was a Christian. He didn't say, return unto me my salvation, but the joy of it. You know, the most miserable person in this church tonight is a saved person who doesn't have any joy. Is a saved person because you can't enjoy the things of the world. You may try it, but it turns bitter in your mouth. You just can't enjoy it. You can't enjoy the things of God because you're not spiritually right. And there you are, and you don't have any joy. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the living God, is the way that we have joy. 